1380 WAOK. Okay, let's go ahead and give Claude some great big appreciation for his life and his his legacy. Claude Gadabuke is one of the survivors of the Rwandian massacre. That's the term I would use, the genocide. And keep in mind, as I said earlier, there's a new piece that's out by Judy Rivers. She wrote this book that is actually called In Praise of Blood, The Crimes of the Rwandian Patriotic Front. And what she's doing there, she's raising questions about the role that Paul Kangami, the uh, I think he's the present president of Rwanda, what he played in this whole situation. Listen, we have Claude on the on, on the line. Claude, how you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing, Dr. Bennett? Man, I'm I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine. I am just honored and 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 just excited that you could find time in your busy schedule to be a part of this conversation, especially in light of the the twenty first, the twenty fourth. I'm sorry, the twenty fourth um, um, commemoration. I would say of the genocide in in Rwanda. Tell us a little bit about yourself, Claude. Tell us a little bit about yourself and. Um, and kind of help us to appreciate um, the the context for this 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 massive human catastrophe. Um, first, thank you for having me on the show, uh, Dr. Bennett, and for giving time to commemorate the genocide in Rwanda that took place in 1994. Um, first, I would just like to um, send my sympathy to all Rwandan people who lost their loved ones during this genocide and also those who lost their loved ones in other massacres that occurred before, during, and after the genocide. And as you referred to on your introduction, uh, the book by Judy River talks about uh, some of those other massacres. Um, so just to give you some background on the genocide um, and myself, I was born in Rwanda, grew up as a worry-free kid. Uh, <coughs> I was oblivious to the fact that Rwanda even had ethnic groups. Uh, in fact, as a little boy, as a young kid, I thought that Rwanda was the only country in the world. <laughs> Probably not much different than many people you know, mm -hmm. or that we know. Uh, but I, uh, but I think their country is the only country in the world. Um, so I thought, you know, every person was Rwandan. Uh, I thought Muhammad Ali was Rwandan, Bob Marley was Rwandan, <laughs> Michael Jackson was Rwandan. <laughs> you know, every person, basically, uh, every black person. Mm -hmm. I knew there was a place called Europe where white people came from, and they spoke with a really heavy accent when they spoke Kenya Rwanda. But I thought that was also part of Rwanda. <laughs> and I later understood that Rwanda was just one country, uh, that was surrounded by other countries. And in fact, um, in, on uh, October 1st, 1990, on my way to school, I saw a bunch of military trucks. I had never seen a soldier dressed for war. Before that, all the soldiers I had seen looked like Boy Scouts. They dressed in these tan suits, and the most uh, weapons that they carried were clubs. Um, and so when I saw them with this heavy weaponry and everything, I wondered what it was. And this was a war that started in 1990 when the Rwandan Patriotic Front, uh, which is, uh, in short, the RPF, uh, invaded Rwanda. And this was a group of Rwandans, Rwandan refugees, who were exiled 30 years prior when uh, Rwanda went from being a monarchy to a republic, and Rwanda got independence from the Belgians. And I also understood that the invading army was a Tutsi army. And Tutsi is one of the ethnic groups in Rwanda. And so I started to understand that there were multiple ethnic groups in Rwanda, the Hutus, the Tutsis, and the Tuas. Uh, but I couldn't tell them apart. And even today, it's almost like trying to tell, if you ask me to tell you between two people who's a Hutu and who's a Tutsi, in the general population of Rwanda, it's like me trying to tell you who's from Georgia and who's from Tennessee. <laughs> it's that difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a person that's black, speaks the same language as the next person, looks the same, eats the same food, practices the same religious and cultural 
uh, practices in basically everything, no separate neighborhoods, um, where here in the U.S., you can look at a person and know that they're white, black, Hispanic, Polynesian, Indian, um, Asian, or, or you name it. In Rwanda, everybody's black. There's a very small, at least when growing up, there was a very, very small um, population of non-black people. And so it was very confusing to me, um, but I knew that the war was dangerous because soon after that, months month into the war, I started seeing people injured. Uh, and there were refugees coming into central Rwanda. I grew up in Kigali, uh, which is in the center of Rwanda, and that's the capital of the country. And refugees were coming from the northern part of Rwanda, where the invading army was coming from, Uganda. And they were settling in these tent cities, uh, similar to those uh, tent cities in Haiti after the earthquake. Uh, those type of tent cities, they were setting those up right near the city of Kigali. Uh, people started coming to the, out to the streets begging. There were a lot of homeless people, a lot of hungry kids, a lot of really, really malnourished and skinny people. And they, they, they had no places to go. They had no, no food, and they were begging for food. And as it developed, um, the war went on for four years, uh, so from 1990 to 1994. And during those years, a number of things developed. There were groups of political, there were political parties that were introduced in the country, uh, which Rwanda was a, a one-party system before that war. It became a multi-party system. These parties set up youth wings, and those youth wings, um, as time went, they started fighting battles and rioting in the streets that sometimes when we went to school, there were so many riots in, on so many different days that we weren't sure that we would make it home. Uh, and then on top of that, there were terrorist attacks. Um, places like bus stations and markets were attacked with explosions and explosives, and uh, mines started going off on cars. And the general insecurity continued to develop and the rebels continued to advance, uh, the government in place was predominantly uh, Hutu. And as I said, the rebels were predominantly Tutsi. Um, and on top of that, so you've got two things. You've got those political parties. You've got the riots. You've got the, um, the terrorist attacks. And then another element emerged, which was political assassination, where politicians high ranking politicians were assassinated one by one, uh, sometimes in execution style. Mm. And the government blamed the rebels, the rebels blamed the government, and it went on. There were also massacres. Um, massacres, uh, some uh, blamed on the government and others blamed on the rebels. And the refugee crisis uh, was, was major in the city of Kigali. Uh, Rwanda was a country of seven to eight million people, and almost a m over a million people had fled that war uh, because this was one of the most densely populated area in the country. And Rwanda itself is the most densely populated country in the world. So you have more people per square mile wow. than any other place in the world, including China and India and Bangladesh, who have over a billion people in each one of those countries. Wow. Rwanda wow. still has more people per square mile than any other place. All right, Claude, hang tight. I've got to go to a break. Don't go any place. I've got okay. to go to a break. Um, news and Talk Radio 1380, WAOK, the voice of the community. We're talking about the legacy of Rwanda, and we have Mr. Claude Gatabuke, who is on the other end, and he's filling us and giving us a, a, a view from, some, from boots on the ground. Got a lot to talk about. Don't go anywhere. Look forward to the conversation and to your raising questions and being a part of this thing. Don't go anywhere. News and Talk Radio 1380 WAOK, the voice of the community. Call us at 404-892-2703 on News and Talk 1380 WAOK. News and Talk Radio 1380 WAOK, the voice of the community. You got to give it some thought. You got to think about some things. You know what? You hear it. I hear it. You hear it. That's that African drum dance. We're calling the community. 
to attention, letting the community know some stuff that's going on that we need to pay close attention to. And we have with us today Mr. Claude Gadabuke, who is a survivor of the crises and the, the genocide in Rwanda. Claude, you was telling us about uh, your experience there. Go on, sir. Uh, yes, so um, I was uh, just to real quickly summarize the uh, earlier points, there was political assassination, there were terrorist attacks, there was uh, the massacres in different parts of the country, there were political riots in uh, various uh, parts of the city of Kigali, and on top of that, there was a refugee crisis of over a million people moving into an already crowded city, and uh, that created uh, a resources issue. So if I put it in today's terms, maybe for the viewers to understand is if you had 30 million Americans move to Atlanta wow. or D.C. or New York, what would traffic be like? What would your cell phone reception be like? What would, you, what would the stores, the supermarkets and the, the grocery stores, the lines be like? So that's, that was um, escalating. On top of that, the last thing that was kind of leading up to this environment, this genocidal environment, was the general insecurity, where before um, Rwanda was fairly safe. There were no weapons, uh, but now there was so much access to weapons, um, normal, regular uh, burglaries and robberies and regular crime was committed using these uh, wartime weapons, um, uh, wartime guns and grenades that I was, I had gotten accustomed to the sound, to the irregular sound of gunfire, especially at night, or grenade blasts. And to give you perspective, it was cheaper for me to buy a grenade than it was for me to buy a bottle of soda. It, was, wow. it would have been cheaper for me to buy a grenade than it would have been for me to buy a loaf of bread. That's just to give you some perspective um, on how this environment was. So in the middle of all of this, the rebel group, uh, the RPF, which, is, which was mostly Tutsi, and the government, which was mostly Hutu, uh, were negotiating a peace deal between the two countries. And by the way, uh, the extremists on, uh, the extremists, uh, on, on the Hutu side were using the atrocities by the rebels in this war to, uh, to fuel uh, and to, to uh, increase propaganda in, you know, of hate against the Tutsis. So uh, if you were in the U.S. basically uh, taking the crimes of one, uh, one a group within a race and attributing them to a whole uh, group of uh, people, which we are very used to, you know, we see some of that right, in the right, U.S., right. Um, where everyone is looked at and treated the same way as the criminal elements of that community. Um, and that's what was happening in the propaganda in some of the hate media and some of the extremists were propagating. And so now fast forward to April 1994, and uh, on April 6, 1994, um, I heard these major blasts, unlike the gunfire or the grenade blast that I was used to. There were two of them. And then a little bit after that, someone called the house and told my mother that the president's plane had been shot. The Rwandan president, the Hutu man, uh, who was also with the Burundian president, also another Hutu man, uh, who were uh, both killed in that uh, uh, plane shooting. Initially, my reaction was, oh, man, I hope the president didn't die because we just won the semifinals of this tournament and we're going to the final this weekend. Uh, you know, I hope he didn't die because we got to finish that soccer tournament. That was my thought as a little boy. Mm -hmm. um, my mother was really scared. My sisters were really scared. And that same night, we started hearing uh, shelling, explosions everywhere. This was nothing like what we were used to. We started hearing heavy gunfire from all kinds of corners of the city, the city and uh, structures crumbling and 
people screaming for help. It was, it was scary. Dogs were barking. Uh, animals were making, you know, animal sounds. And, I mean, just everywhere, all you heard was sounds, but they were being drowned by the amount of shelling and the gunfire. And that kept going to the next day. But we got out to see what was going on, and the neighborhood looked like it was untouched, but people were scared. And one of the first things I noticed was uh, one of my next-door neighbors stood in front of his house, and he basically picked people walking past his house, and he would decide and say, you're a Tutsi, get in my house. And whoever resisted, he would beat them into submission. He was armed to his teeth with grenades and, you know, all kinds of weapons, guns, and he would just beat them down into his house. And he had countless men and women in that house when he opened that door to put the next victim in there. And at night, he would kill them. Oh, my. And um, it got really bad. Um, it kept getting worse. Um, the militias, uh, the extremist Hutu militias, started running through the streets and going house to house and hunting down Tutsis and killing them, and bodies were piling up on the side of the street. Meanwhile, the shelling is increasing. Uh, the gunfire is increasing, and we could see the explosions at night, not in the daytime, but we were so used to it that I could tell from this first explosion of the shell to the whistling over our heads that I could tell you exactly when it's going to land. And... Then that war continued, and so the massacres and the Tutsis were being hunted down like wild animals in um, various parts of the country, but for sure in my neighborhood. We ended up fleeing our house um, after uh, going into hiding in a shed, a uh, storage shed behind our house, and hearing neighbors searching for us to kill us. Um, we were taken in by some neighbors, some Hutu neighbors, uh, that sheltered us, and finally, because it kept getting worse, and the, the house had already been hit by a shell, um, and just there were running battles between the rebels who were taking over the city, and they were also coming and abducting people or killing people in their homes. Um, you know, it just got more and more dangerous, and this family finally hired a pickup truck to take us out of that city, the Kigali city, thinking that it would be safer outside of, uh, on the countryside. And we headed west toward uh, the Congo. And we kept running into checkpoints. And we kept getting stopped, and they would threaten to kill us. From time to time, they would take people out and keep them. Uh, there was once when we were stopped, and they pulled over a bunch of cars, and someone pulled up. It was a military guy. And he ordered all of the vehicles to get back in line with him and leave. And that was his way of saving people that were about to be slaughtered. And we could see the dead bodies in the woods mm. um, just right above us. And then after we separated from that long line of cars to go to our destination, we got stopped at another checkpoint. And I was taken out of the car and my mother was taken out of that car, that truck. And they took us away from the street, took us to a storage shed. And it was raining, it was, um, you know, dripping like a scene from a scary movie with no music, just the rain and, you know, you could hear all the sounds. And these guys um, who were getting ready to kill us, these militias, um, just as they were gathering, a bunch of neighbors rushed in. And they, kept run they came running, they kept a little bit of a distance, but they started yelling at these guys and saying, stop killing people, leave, the leave them alone, don't kill them. And, you know, uh, they distracted them for a little bit but the militias who were about to kill us ordered us to dig our own grave they, mm. they said go to those people that are yelling at us borrow some shovels and hoes dig your grave because we gotta bury you after we kill you so I went all the way to my own grave oh my. with my mother oh my um, wow Claude so do this do this for me as you can hear the music playing I'm up against another break listen right put a, put a pin in it make a note when we come back on the other side, we're going to let you kind of wrap this up, and we're going to start having some questions from our from our callers. My goodness, okay. there's a lot to talk about, everybody. And we have Mr. Claude Gadabuke, a survivor of the Rwandan genocide, with us. News and Talk Radio, 1380 WAOK, -OK, the voice of the community. I am just sitting here um, speaking.
spellbound. I, I tell you, thinking about what our guest is sharing with us. Listen, the number is 448922703. I'm going to open the lines and you can call in. Um, I do have some slots available. You can call in and we can talk with Mr. Gadabuke about Rwanda and about his experience there and about the genocide and about all of the, 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 the atrocities he experienced, you know, being there with the Hutus and the Tutsis and all of the all of all of just the massive carnage. And, you know, you can you can talk with him directly. That number is four zero four eight nine two two seven zero three and be a part of the, the the conversation. Claude, go on. You you had just gotten to the point where you all were um, digging the grave. Uh, yes. So at that point, uh, those neighbors are still over there yelling, and the truck driver came back first with one guy, and then he went. He left and came back with another guy. Seeing that truck driver come back gave me some hope. I had already resigned to, and I was so scared. My mother was throwing up. Uh, first, I was shaking and my stomach bubbling, and then I became numb, and I was resigned to the fact that this was the end of. I was dead at this point. It was just a matter of time. And those two guys that came, they were they brave. They were brave enough to come close enough and negotiate, and they negotiated and negotiated. And we got to this place. It was early afternoon. It was pitch black when one of the negotiators said, you know, this boy and his mom are not going to make it five miles from here, so why don't you just let somebody else kill them? And they somehow agreed to that. And so we got back on the truck, and we left. We ended up getting taken in by a family near the border of the Congo, where we sheltered. At first, it was just us, myself, my mom, my two sisters, and a cousin, uh, plus that family um, of wife, husband, and two kids. And then they kept taking in more and more and more people that by the end of the war and the genocide, there were like over 30 people in that house. Wow. Uh, we ended up crossing the border into the Congo, which was very dangerous, and were met with the, the cholera outbreak, which is a disease that kills you with dehydration. And we went from going over dead bodies inside of Rwanda who were killed in that war or in the various massacres that took place or the genocide to now walking past dead bodies and the stench, the look, I mean, the sky was all on, basically it was like all smoke. The stench of decomposing human body was, it would make you throw up. Mm. Um, and, and it was just a mixture of fire, burning, dust, and mm. smoke. Uh, that's coming from that whole war. So when we crossed to, into the Congo, it was a little bit more calm, but there was this disease that was killing people. And finally, we out of the Congo, we ended up going to Uganda and then Kenya, and finally came to the U.S. Uh, the refugees that were left behind, um, when we crossed that border into the Congo, between one, about 2 million people crossed that border. And they, the, what happened was the RPF, the, the rebel, the original rebels, they ended up winning the war, and they took over the country. And they turned around and they attacked the refugee camps, the 10 cities in the Congo of the Hutu refugees, and over 200,000 people were killed in some horrific massacres that were later documented in the UN mapping exercise report for the DRC that documented only, and I repeat, only the most serious crimes. So there were more than what was documented in there. But what the UN said was that if taken to court, the RPF, which is led by Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, could be found for genocide. Wow. So there was a genocide in 94, and then there was later a genocide committed by the uh, rebel force that took over that uh, committed it against um, the, the Hutu refugees. Inside of Rwanda was against the Tutsi. Outside of Rwanda was against the, the Hutus. Um, and then uh, those massacres continued, and uh, of course they also went on to loot the Congo, and it turned the region upside down to where now over 6 million Congolese people have died in this since the invasion of the Congo in 1996 by 
Rwandan and Ugandan troops. And half of those victims are children under the age of five. My so babies, basically. Um, and today, uh, Rwanda has become, well, has always been, but now has, it's become really clear to the world that it's a, it's a dictatorship. Uh -huh. uh, where Paul Kagame rules with an iron fist, any dissident voices are uh, the anyone that that speaks against any of his policies or disagrees with him, they're killed, exiled, or jailed, mm. and many people are disappeared. Um, in fact, uh, this last uh, I don't know how many people followed, but Paul Kagame just. W "Quote unquote," won an election where he assigned himself ninety nine percent of the vote. Um, of wow. course, we know no one can win ninety nine percent of any voting, uh, but that's what he uh, won previously after extending his terms from um, ending in twenty seventeen to potentially ending in twenty thirty four, which would make him a serving um, leader, the de facto leader of Rwanda from ninety four to 2034, a whole 40 years, almost two generations. Um, and so that's where we are now in Rwanda. There's a uh, struggle for freedom, a uh, struggle for reconciliation. Uh, the, because the ruling party in place in Rwanda has committed so many massacres, and as you mentioned in the introduction, mm -hmm. now documented in the book, uh, In Praise of Blood, and has had the backing, this is very important, Wow. have the backing of Western nations. Wow. The primary donors are the United Kingdom and the United States. L let me do this. Uh, let, let's do this, Claude. I've got a couple of callers who are just itching to, to talk with you. Are you, would you. are you open to taking some questions? Uh, yes. Okay. All right, let's do this. I'm going to go to Bill. Bill, you're on. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon I, first became, I first became aware of what was going on in Rwanda about 20 years ago. And it, it was mentioning the fact that uh, people were being uh, decapitated, arms being cut off, and all of this and thrown in the rivers in, the, uh, uh, in that country. And, and I never could figure out how can someone hate someone so much that they would kill them and feed them the crocodile. But evidently, this is what went on. And, you know, our usual whiners say, well, if the white man fought, if the white man hadn't been there, uh, they would have never had a war. And I disagree with that because there have been wars throughout Africa for the last two or three thousand years. But people seem to forget when you, when you mention that, they come up with another excuse about, well, if they hadn't been interfering with their lifestyle, they would have uh, uh, been at peace with each other. But... I was reading about the uh, large tribe that moved from Central Africa to South Africa, and, and every step of the way they had to fight uh, people who lived on that land and who wasn't a member of that tribe. But, you know, stuff like that seemed to be conveniently forgotten when you mentioned facts. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just wondering, when are some people going to recognize that all black people ain't good, and all white people ain't bad. <laughs> it's just a matter of who want to be in power. And wow. that's, that's the main thing. So wow. I'll just add that to you. But if you ever get a chance to check out that book, it's called uh, Out of America by, uh, I'm trying to remember the guy's name, but uh, uh, it's, it's an interesting book to read about what he saw while he was over there because he was a journalist from the United States and traveled over there during that era. Wow. Well, I tell you what, Bill, Bill, I tell you, did you have a question for, for Mr. Gadabuke before we go to this break? Well, I just asked, do he think that things are really going to improve within the next decade or they're going to remain as they are? I think things are going to improve. I did want to touch on the fact that uh, what you're saying is true. Uh, what happened in the conflict uh, in Rwanda and um, in Central Africa right now is power struggle, but uh, it's both internal and external. There is there is a role being played by the Africans themselves, but there is also the support of people like Paul Kagame and Yoweri Museveni, who are presidents of Uganda and Rwanda, causing havoc in the region, who are supported by the U.S. and the U.K. 
but I do think that things are going to change because what we're seeing now are the youth are hungry for change. Wow. The youth are pushing for change. And because of the, ability, the technology and social media, people are more connected, more able to see the news. So it's harder. The, one of the things that dictators use to, is control of information. And now it's a little bit more difficult to control information going to the people when there's social media and technology and everyone has access to it. And that's helping educate and enlighten the youth and also show them the power that they have to change and control their own destiny. So I do think that in the next decade, things are going to be different. It's already different now. Just when you look at what comes out in the media and the stories of people really being exposed that were never told when things were happening because the people couldn't see for themselves. Wow. Oh, okay, right, the name of, that, name of that author was Keith Richburg. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. All but right. that was the name of the article uh, called Out of Africa. Thank you. I'll oh. check it out. Thank All you. Right. All right, listen, News and Talk Radio, 1380 WAOK. Todd, don't go anywhere. Jerikas, don't go anywhere. My other callers, don't go anywhere. We're going to come right back and finish this conversation on the other side. News and Talk Radio, 1380 WAOK, the voice of the community. Call us at 404-892-2703 on News and Talk 1380 WAOK. News and Talk Radio 1380, WAOK, the voice of the community. We're talking about Rwanda and the Rwandan genocide. 24 years ago, April 7, 1994, you know, I've read and I've seen figures between 700,000 on the low end, a million on the upper end of human beings who were massacred in a, in a civil war and on the, on the line with us is Mr. Claude Gadabuke a, a survivor of that, that, that atrocity? And he's talking with us about what it was like and, and what he saw going on. And, and he's actually uh, here to take our questions. The number is 404-892-2703, 404-892-2703. I'm going to go to Jerika's. Jerika's, you're on. Hey, Doc. How are you? I'm good. How you doing? I'm 135%. Look at that. Yes, sir. I'm I'm good to be on tonight. Um, first, I want to um, say hello to Mr. Claude and, and just just hello, Jerika. Is still here. Sorry, I didn't catch your question. I I just want to thank God that you're still here and that you survived. Thank you. Appreciate it. And you've been through a lot, and so I I, I wanted to ask you the question. I know brother the brother who was on before. Um, I, I disagree with him strongly that it was, you know, we talk about this whole tribal war, you know, um, I, I'm not on that side of with people who like to say black on black crime and all that crap. They just try to get away from the real problem, uh, which is white, white male domination. Um, but I wanted to ask you, um, what is the outlook of the youth and, and this, uh, next generation as it pertains to, um, the history of the genocide. What What is the narrative that is told? Is it told that the genocide was um, because of domination? Um, or what, what is the narrative that is told to the, to the next generation about this genocide? Thank you for your question and uh, your kind words. Uh, first, I, you actually um, helped me... Um, add another layer and another important detail to this uh, uh, so-called tribal war. It was not a tribal war. It was not one tribe versus another. Uh, this was a fight for control of power in the country by small groups within larger ethnic groups. And there was a, a European component to it where uh, the tool that was used for the most part to recognize what ethnic group people belong to was the ID card. And those ID cards that state what ethnic group a person belonged to were introduced and brought to Rwanda by uh, uh, the colonialists, the Belgians. 
So uh, it does go back to that. Uh, that was used as a big tool to uh, identify people, uh, people who ended up getting killed, many who ended up getting killed. The uh, current narrative by the government of Rwanda is that this was a genocide that was planned by the previous administration and that basically the Hutus uh, got up and... Um, and started uh, slaughtering Tutsis, and uh, basically they have a kind of a fabricated context of things that led up to it. Uh, and then on top of that, they assigned, uh, they, they're assigning collective guilt to a whole ethnic group, which is kind of goes to that black and black, black on black crime uh, aspect that you were talking about, where you have criminal elements in every ethnicity, in every uh, group of people. But then looking at a whole group of people and assigning them guilt uh, because they just happen to be the same uh, ethnic group. Uh, one of the things that's happening in Rwanda is also they have uh, these uh, indoctrination camps where they're training um, a, a, another militia, a new militia in Rwanda called uh, Inore. And this, uh, this group is used to harass anyone that disagrees with the government. Uh, inside and outside of the country. They are the cheerleaders of the president, and they're making it a requirement for almost every youth um, to attend. Uh, there are even people who go from Europe and in the U.S. and other places and attend these uh, training camps. However, there's also a parallel um, youth movement where many young people are saying, what we're seeing is not right, what we're seeing is not correct, and we're going to inform not only our families and friends, but the world of what's happening because uh, we demand change. Uh, so you're starting to see people like uh, street vendors that the government doesn't want in the country because Rwanda projects an image of cleanliness and other things. So to do that, they arrest um, especially young people and uh, street vendors and they hold them in communication cattle uh, in this holding and sometimes torture chambers. And um, you're seeing resistance, even in the streets, where the, these young people are just saying, look, I'm not going to give up my livelihood, and I am willing to face the consequences. Or they're demonstrating and, and, and basically resisting the enforcers who are law enforcement. Uh, another thing that's happened recently are, surprisingly, not by Rwandans, but by Congolese refugees and Burundian refugees who have started defying and refusing to comply with all of the oppressive laws and rules put on them in the refugee camps in Rwanda. The Burundians have already, a uh, large number of them, been returned to Burundi, uh, and the Congolese were actually shot. Uh, they shot the Congolese refugees. There were thousands of them demonstrating, um, asking to be moved out of Rwanda or sent back to Congo, which is a dangerous place to go because conditions were bad in Rwanda. But because Rwanda does not allow any kind of demonstration or freedom of speech or freedom of association, people are starting to take it up in their own hands, and uh, they're, they're suffering the consequences. Dozens of them were killed. Um, the other thing that's happened lately is uh, they're closing down churches, which has got people now, uh, their form of resistance is going to cave in forests and woods and different places and in gathering but the government is trying to ban any kind of uh, uh, group gathering or coming together and the people are resisting in those different forms so that's the outlook and those are the two parallel routes uh, the one that's complying with the government and actually participating in it by joining those militias those in order militias or the ones that are resisting and continuing to do their activities even if it puts them in trouble Wow, and that's that sounds and that sounds like a lot like where America's headed. <laughs> Very yeah. close. Yeah. Wow, wow. Well, I tell you, well, thank you, Jerikas. Thank you so much for your call. Four four eight nine two two seven zero three. Let's go to Todd. Todd, you ready? Todd, are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Okay. Man, I can hear you very well. What's going on today? I have four questions. I I like to know what is the, what is the median age in Rwanda these days? Do you happen to know? I don't actually have the exact number, but I think it's the late 20s. 
I think the majority of Rwandans are uh, under the age of 30. That's what I would think as well. And can you tell me, do you have a low... Do you have a relatively low infant mortality rate there? Are you are you bringing most of your children in through their first year healthy? Based on the reports, yes, uh, but it's hard to know whether that's true or not because uh, researchers have shown that the way that uh, the Rwandan government reports data is is not um, up to par, and some of the figures are incorrect or made up. Uh, but it has, uh, by the various reports that I've read, it has gotten better, and it's one of the lowest on the continent. I thought it thought it might be relatively low at this point. And um, what's your major crop there? Uh, the major crop for export is coffee and tea. And then uh, I have- for consumption, it's uh, beans and uh, a variety of roots, including. Uh, potatoes, sweet and non-sweet potatoes, and cassava and uh, yuca, you know, and the various other um, um, crops. Have the American are mar- have the American markets treated you well? Are you are your prop are your crops getting into our into our stores? The we mainly coffee, going over to Europe. The coffee for sure um, for a while, but Rwanda now is in is actually um, as of last week. Uh, having issues with the U.S. administration because uh, Rwanda banned importing of um, second-hand clothing. And the the U.S. government has uh, given Rwanda a warning that uh, they will be removed from the AGOA. I I don't know if you're familiar with the AGOA, which is basically uh, kind of a tax-free export. There are certain goods that are tax-free, and because of the impact to the American uh, economy and market with the second-hand clothing, they, this was actually an issue in the whole region. The rest of the countries in the region decided they will continue exporting, importing uh, second-hand clothing. Um, the irony for me is that for years, we have presented the U.S. government with uh, evidence of um, abuses of human rights, uh, we've had uh, congressional hearings and various other things. I mean, millions of Congolese of people killed, the looting of other countries, uh, violating other people's for- sovereignty, um, and using child soldiers, which are all, most of these are against U.S. policy and against um, uh, U.S. laws. And the U.S. did not take uh, public action wow. against the government of Rwanda, but for millions of dollars and, and it's not a lot i think it was uh, if i remember correctly it may, it may have been like 150 million dollars uh, a year maybe for the region uh, so not a lot of money but because of that wow. uh they're being sanctioned and sanctioned publicly wow let's, let me do this let, let me that. let me interrupt gentlemen both of you hold tight i'm up against a break todd don't go anywhere claude hang tight we're gonna let you finish this Conversation with Todd on the other side of this break. News and Talk Radio 1380 WAOK, the voice of the community. Call us at 404-892-2703 on News and Talk 1380 WAOK. News and Talk Radio 1380 WAOK, the voice of the community. Yes, this is Give It Some Thought with Dr. Harold Bennett. And you're listening to Claude Gadabuke, a survivor of the Rwandian uh, massacre that occurred uh, April 7th, actually 24 years ago. And he's casting some light on that on that situation. We have Todd on the other end and Todd's going to finish his question so we can get to our others. Todd, you back on. OK, um, Claude Gadabuke, I, I recognize that. Um we're, we're basically talking about the the genocide that happened, but because my questions are pres- the reason my questions are present day questions is because I wanted people to hear what the conditions are of the country are now, how it's progressing, and what uh, what other nations are contributing to it. So I just want you to know I wasn't trying to uh, avoid the actual the initial topic. Okay. No, talk, I, I think, totally agree. All right, cool. No, we need to talk about the past and the present because. Mm-hmm. 
Then let me and ask at you, the end of the day, the past can't change. Then let me ask you these last three real matter-of-fact questions. Could you explain to the public, I could pretty much guess, why, why, why specifically secondhand clothing was banned to the country? I, based on my research, uh, the secondhand clothing uh, is a, it's a big market. And I, and I think part of it is the U.S. doing some recycling. That's part of it, um, of its clothing. Obviously, you know, it's also done here in the U.S. in Goodwill stores and Salvation Army and other stores and thrift stores. Uh, but there's also a market outside of the U.S. where people really do consume these things. Uh, and, and I think there is some strong lobbying um, that basically pushed the policy. Uh, to or be, push for the enforcement of the policy in the terms of the AGOA participation by the by Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda, what they say is uh, they do not want to be a dumping ground right. for uh, the for the U.S. Um, but also, uh, Rwanda is developing a textile market uh, to serve Rwandans. I do think, though, that. Um, <coughs> Given the history of the RPF, the RPF, uh, which is the party in power in Rwanda, is the richest party in the world. The, the largest business empire. They have the largest business empire. I think they're creating a market for themselves to be able to sell clothes to Rwandans, and I think a lot of Rwandans are going to end up looking like a uniform because you know the the industry not being developed enough to actually produce clothes, um, even by countries like Kenya, who are far more advanced than Rwanda, uh, I, I think that uh, part of it is creating a market for themselves, and I also see some short-term issues with it because there are a lot of people who live off of uh, selling those clothes, and there are people who cannot afford buying new clothes, uh, but the argument by the government of Rwanda is that they don't want to be a dumping ground for, um, for the U.S. or Western countries. And the clothes are marked up much higher than what they should be to you. Yep. But let me ask you this last question. Do you have the, can you speak on to what degree the European nations, the North American nations, including the United States, and any aggressive behavior by the UN has been demonstrated to help your, um, young, your young people study abroad for the purpose of engineering, farming, and construction, as well as contributing to help and improve the education for engineering, construction, and farming in the country? I'm actually not familiar with that. Uh, where there is an intentional uh, outreach or even a relationship in terms of um, engineering and farming um, and construction development uh, in education exchange or you know uh, however you may you may uh, put it, I do know that there are multiple places, multiple universities that have uh, a relationship with uh, Rwanda and they take in uh, students on scholarships. Uh, the but the role that I really would like to talk about that I think uh, everyone should know about is the role that our taxes have have played in actually the destruction of a lot of Central Africa, especially the Congo, because Rwanda. When I speak of Rwanda, Rwanda is interconnected with its neighbors, and Rwanda and Uganda have invaded the Congo, and not only did they have the political backing by Western nations like the U.S. and the U.K in the European Union, um, they have also received military training, military support, and uh, they have basically served as kind of a proxy army for uh, the U.S. and the U.K. and the Western nations in places that these nations do not want to um, send troops to. Uh, for example, Somalia, you know, the Central African Republic, and Sudan, sometimes serving as peacekeepers and sometimes serving as mercenaries. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure many of you have heard, or maybe, maybe you haven't, but there's actually in Uganda um, a program where people are trained to go fight in Iraq and in the Middle East. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure that the American public understands that, number one, this issue and these wars and these fights are not tribal fights where... You've got a whole tribe of people trying to exterminate another tribe of people. It's power struggle by a select number of individuals supported by powerful nations. 
And <clears throat> on top of that, uh, there is participation and we're contributing to it. The last thing that I would like to add is that we are all actually connected to this conflict by the thing that's closest to us probably in this moment, which is our phones. Um, in the, the Congo has the largest natural resource uh, known as coltan, which is used in cell phones, in um, fat TVs, and other uh, electronic gadgets that we consume. And people are dying on the ground because uh, greedy corporations and leaders are willing to fight these proxy wars and uh, bring these technologies that we want, and we can use our power, our phones, to actually exercise our rights and push for policy change to make sure that whatever the policies are in those regions, we are not contributing with our own, you know, the things that we consume uh, to fueling these conflicts. And I really think that that can be done. And we have demonstrated that when the people get together and they push and they push these uh, governments, we can get certain things and certain um, policies put in place. It's difficult, but it can be done. And I think I just want to let everybody know that we are powerful enough to do that. You have the power and you have the tools. All right. All right, Todd, thank you so very much thank for you. Thank you. This was an excellent topic. I'll talk to you later. No, not not a problem at all. Four four nine two two seven zero three. I'm going to go to Ann. Ann, you're on. Hello. Firstly, I'd like to thank you for this program, Dr. Bennett. It's oh, just thank perfect. you. Thank you. Uh, and I don't have to go to NPR tonight. I can listen to you. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> this is the kind of information we need, and it's so appropriate because of the um, commemoration of such a horrible event. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much. Oh, no. Thank you for listening, and, and you continue to listen to uh, News and Talk Radio 1380 WAOK, the voice of the community. Now, have you joined the group on the gist with Do- the gist with Dr. Harold Bennett? Have you joined the Facebook group? Have you joined I, that group? I just made that note. I'm one of these people who, when I I speak out too much, suddenly I don't have internet. Um, so I won't get into that. Please. In my political problem. But I guarantee you, I wrote it down, and I okay. will certainly look at that. All right, Thank I you. want you to do that. Thank you so very, very, very much. All well, right, this, all right. I, Listen. I was asked some questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, you can get a question. I tell you what, I tell you what, I have a break right now. Please, please, you are so kind. Don't go anywhere. On the other side of the break, you are going to have a conversation with Mr. Gadabuke, and you can talk Rwanda, things Rwanda with him on the other side of the break. Will you Will you hang tight, and Don't go anywhere, okay? Thank you for having him. I certainly won't go anywhere. Okay, don't go anywhere. News and Talk Radio, 1380 WAOK, the voice of the community. WAOK, the voice of the community. Yes, Dr. Harold V. Bennett is back. And I am the discussion facilitator. That's the term I'm going to use today. We have Mr. Claude Gadabuke, who is a survivor of the Rwandian uh, genocide, massacre, catastrophe. You know, slaughter. It's just so many terms I could use to talk about that horrific thing that occurred there. And you all have questions for him. 449-2270-3. And you're back. We're back with you. Go ahead, Ann. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Garabuki, first of all, I'd like to commend you for your excellent command of the language. Uh, the English you, um, is just not quite as, you know, as much of an accent. And I know, based on my experiences with my African friends, they will often communicate with all the all uh, the people in the neighboring villages, and I'm wondering how much of that Belgian French has come in to influence you. And so I'm very impressed with your English. Congratulations on such a command. How long have you been exposed to English? Where do you live? I live in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, I've been exposed to English for 22, almost 23 years now. So I didn't speak any English when I first came to the U.S., and I've got a lot of funny stories from those times uh, when I couldn't speak any English and people would speak to me and I would just smile and keep going. So if you told me, hey, you left your light, your car lights on, I would just smile and keep going. Well, well, you survived wonderfully. Were you, so Belgian, the French then would have been Belgian French, or what was the French that you would have had in Rwanda? It was Belgian. Uh, we spoke, uh, the Belgians were the uh, colonial masters, and uh, the language, the official language was French. Mm-hmm, so it was Belgian. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. yeah, I say that because I'm an old French teacher, so I, I'm so I know about the struggles, and I certainly appreciate language struggles. So thank you so much for communicating so well and being an encouragement to so many of of the Africans I've gotten to know. Um, I was wondering about the U.S.'s role. Bill Clinton was a, was accused of being too slow to react to the Rwandan war. Uh, but, and now you tell us that the U.K. and the United States have some hand in some of the negative things that are happening there. How so? And are there any natural resources that these greedy whites um, from uh, the U.K. and the U.S. might be trying to seek out in Rwanda? Um, I, I certainly think they're always motivated by greed, and I understand what you were saying about the natural resources. So I, I, like, I thank you so much, and uh, I've, I've seen a lot of the reports on um, the Rwandan um, problems, and um, I, I'm just so gratified to have survived. Thank you so much, and, and please comment on those natural resources for me. Thank you again, Dr. Bennett. Oh, thank oh, you. Oh, way. Thank you. Bill. Thank you. The, the guy who condemned um, uh, anybody who criticized whites. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill is a black Republican, and he's always defending whites. He lives out in Henry County, and he would one would be expecting for him to say something like, all blacks are not good and all whites are not bad. I guarantee you that the whites, when they arrive in Africa, are never working in the benefit for the most part of black people, and they just always exacerbate the condition. So remember that anytime you hear Bill. He's a black <laughs> Republican, so he comes out of that perspective. Thank you, and I'm sorry I had to throw that in there. All Thank right, you. no, no. Go ahead, Thank go you. ahead, uh, Claude, and respond to her call. Then we're going to take the last caller because you've, uh, you've been a very patient uh, a guest. And thank you for your question uh, about the resources and the, the role of the U.S. during the genocide. Uh, and um, I just... Um, it's funny that you bring up Bill Clinton. There's an article that uh, my sister uh, and I co-authored uh, about Bill Clinton's comment on Black Lives Matter, uh, where he basically said that Black Lives Matter because he wanted, uh, he, it was during the election. And so you can see what our thoughts are. But uh, in short, uh, it's, not, it's not just that they didn't know, they actually knew. But any kind of intervention to stop the killing or stop the war would have disadvantaged the RPF, which the Bill Clinton administration supported. And Bill Clinton is personal friends uh, with uh, Paul Kagame, the Rwandan president. And even today, a lot of times when uh, there is a lot of negative media and some, um, he needs some rescuing, Bill Clinton is one of the first people to come and, you know, to come to his uh, aid, to his rescue. Uh, in fact, when uh, CGI was taking place every year, Paul Kagame was one of the main speakers uh, at the event, uh, the fundraisers that they used to have in New York. So uh, there's a long history. Uh, on top of that, um, the Clinton administration uh provided cover when Paul Kagame and Yoweri Museveni went and invaded the Congo. In fact, Bill Clinton went to Africa and pronounced them the beacon of hope, the new generation of African leaders. And these are the leaders who have conducted the largest Holocaust in on the continent. Um, so there's that long history of uh, the U.S. government, especially through these individual relationships, uh, that have led to really, really horrible um, deaths. Uh, and I mentioned the three million kids that was under uh, uh, Bill Clinton's watch uh, for the most part. Now, uh, you also asked about the natural resources. Uh, and it's important to note that Rwanda is a very small country, but to me, Rwanda and Burundi, who are like sister countries or twins, basically, are an mm-hmm. extension of the neighbors. And uh, Rwanda provides uh, the infrastructure to transport the natural resources extracted out of the Congo. And the Congo is the richest nation in the world in terms of natural resources. There is $24 trillion, trillion dollars, um, underneath the soil of the Congo. And there is uranium out of the Congo, which is used for 
uh, wall clients. Um, there is copper, there is gold, there is diamond, and there's especially the coltan, which is now really hot with all of the new technology gadgets. So as you said, and there's, uh, there is a website called uh, conflictminerals.org where you can actually find a list of corporations from the U.S., from Canada, from the U.K., from Australia, from France, from Belgium, from various uh, Western countries that are part of this um, conflict, that are basically uh, fueling this conflict. Uh, so, yes, the greed is part of it, for sure, and the, the pursuit of natural resources. The only difference between what's happening in that region, in Central Africa, and what happens in the Middle East is because what happens in the Middle East is out in the media and a lot of people are aware of it. What happens on the continent of Africa is mostly ignored and most of the world does not know what's happening in that place in the amount of resources and the riches that are found on that continent, especially in the Congo itself. And that's why Congo has had so many problems for a long time, even during colonialism. Wow. Congo was robbed, you know, uh, and 10 million people killed. Um, hands chopped off because they, ref you know, some of them resisted and refused to work for the colonial master King Leopold of Belgium. There you go. All right, thank you so much, and thank you so much for your call. I'm going to go to the last call, Virginia. You have the last hello, words. Hello to you, Doctor Harold and Doctor Abutu. Is that the name? Gatabuke. Okay. Well, you know what? I go along with uh, Mr. Bill. They have been fighting in South Africa for a long time, ever since 1800s. Chaka Zulu and, uh, and the, Zoo, uh, the Tusi have been fighting for a long time. Mr. Butu, you are now living in the United States, right? Yes. Hello? Yes, I'm living Hello? in the United States. Can, can you hear him, Miss Virginia? Hello? Can you hear him? I can't hear you. Yes, okay, Virginia, well, I'm living in the United States. Hello? You, you, you don't have to turn your radio down, Miss Virginia. Okay, okay, all right. Uh, I said that he's now living in the United States. Right. Would you approve? Are you going to stay here or are you going back to Africa? Oh, I'm going back to Africa. Yeah. Would, would you all. Now, I lived, I was in Germany. Uh, during this period, and I never heard anyone mention what was going on. I met uh, several people from Zaire at the time, and um, you know, ne nobody never said anything about the striking there. So, um, would you, you all, what you don't want to share to the world the natural resources that you have? No, it's not the issue of not wanting to share. It's just making sure that when the resources are extracted, the, the people in those uh, places are compensated correctly. Uh, but what's happening is basically the most powerful are going in and displacing people, killing people, killing whole villages, and turning those places into mines versus uh, trading with the local people. That, that's what the issue is. Listen, you, that, let me do this. Let me do because I'm actually going to run out of time. I want to thank you, Claude. Got a bouquet for being a part of this conversation tonight. Listen, you all need to go to Give It Some Thought Facebook page and look at the piece there, Living With Our Memories, and you can hear more from, from Claude. All right, got to go. I want to thank Gene Ross, the boss. Got to thank Sean. Want to thank Jackie Teal for having such a strong baby boy. And y'all give your lives some thought.